Good morning and welcome to Toronto Police Headquarters. Today we have Homicide Detective Sergeant Hank Itzinga. He will be providing an update on the investigation in the Bruce MacArthur. Uh, Bruce, Ma Bruce MacArthur. He will also be joined with the Dr. Michael Polanin, the Chief Forensic Pathologist for the Province of Ontario. Good morning. Thank you for being here got a lot of material to get through, uh, so thank you for your patience. Um, I will be providing you with an update on the Bruce MacArthur investigation. As you know, on January the 18th of this year, Bruce MacArthur was arrested. He has been charged with six counts of first degree murder in relation to the deaths of Salim Essen, Andrew Kinsman, Saroosh Mahmoodi, Dean Lisowick, Majid Kahan, and Skanda Navaratnam. The release of evidence by the Toronto Police Service has to strike a balance between the public interest and the fair court process due to Mr. MacArthur. We solve many crimes through the release of evidence to the media. Today, we are going to be releasing a photograph of an individual who we believe is an unidentified victim of Mr. MacArthur. We have utilized numerous investigative techniques to identify this individual and so far have been unsuccessful. We have also shown the picture to numerous contacts within the community and have been unsuccessful. I do not want to release this picture and I'm doing so as a last resort. For those who are watching on our live stream, I would suggest this photo may be disturbing to some viewers. I would also ask the media to be mindful that by broadcasting this picture, a family member or friend, not realizing that their loved one is deceased, may come to that realization from the moment they view the picture. I will not be commenting on how this picture came into our possession. I would ask anyone who recognizes the individual in this picture to contact us as soon as possible. We need, we need to put a name to this face and bring closure to this man's loved ones. One of the focuses of the investigation has been on human remains found within planters from 53 Mallory Crescent. As I have stated before, these remains are of individuals have, who have been dismembered. They are in various stages of decomposition. Doctors from Ontario Forensic Pathology Services have been doing some very difficult and time-consuming work in attempting to reconstruct these remains and identify them. Dr. Kathy Grusbier, a for forensic anthropologist, and Dr. Michael Polanin, chief forensic pathologist for the province of Ontario, have been working tirelessly for weeks to put this very crucial part of the case together. Thanks to their efforts, as I have previously stated, the remains of three individuals have been identified. I can however now report that we have recovered the remains of at least seven individuals from the planters seized at Mallory Crescent. Tests are ongoing in an attempt to continue to identify these victims. Dr. Polanin has been kind enough to join us here today and will be able to comment far better than I can on forensic methodology, how we identify people, and how we search for the truth. Dr. Polanin will take questions after his comments but will not discuss any case-specific matters. I will now turn it over to Dr. Polanin and I will remain and be available after his, uh, his talk for any questions on this unidentified person. Dr. Good morning. Um, as you know, my name is Michael Polanin. I'm the Chief Forensic Pathologist for Ontario. And as such, I represent the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service. We are the main organization in Ontario that investigates uh, sudden and unexpected death uh, using autopsies <coughs> by basically applying the methods of science and medicine to learn the truth behind how people die. 
this particular case has um, challenged the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service and we have used a multidisciplinary approach to try and find the truth behind what's happened. Um, specifically, I wanted to give you some context about this from a methodological point of view and discuss some of the processes that we've been undertaking. Um, to, to, to make it more precise, however, to begin with, we have two major centers of gravity in a case like this. The first is there is an overwhelming humanitarian objective to identify the people uh, who, in this case, have gone missing and then have, have been found um, dismembered and decomposed in planters' pots. This uh, humanitarian objective of determining who went missing, identifying their bodies, is an important application of forensic science and medicine. On the other hand, equally important is the creation of a reliable data set that can be used in the criminal justice process. So it is these two uh, major objectives which have informed our process. This is through teamwork um, because we need to utilize many different scientific disciplines, pathology, anthropology, dentistry, fingerprints, all these different modalities are integrated together to understand what's happened. And I just wanted to leave you with three specific things about how we're doing our work or what we are concentrating on at this moment. The first thing is we need to identify these people using scientific means. The way we do so is by comparing what we call anti-mortem information, that is information about missing people, and we compare that to data that we have obtained through the physical examination um, of <coughs> the remains. That matching of anti-mortem and post-mortem data together uh, produces the identification. The mainstay of that process has been fingerprints, dental identification, um, through the comparison of dental records, um, as well as looking at medical records to determine if there is a similarity between missing people and various surgical procedures or implants that might be present in the body. As part of that whole process, we also utilize DNA, but usually as a last effort based upon the more traditional techniques. This is our uh, primary objective from a humanitarian point of view. The second major thing that we are working on at this moment is determining the cause of death. In these cases, um, or as in any sudden death, death can occur either through disease, injury, or the effects of a toxin, drugs and alcohol. So we are undertaking a systematic scientific analysis of the remains to determine if we can ascertain the cause of death. Third major objective is to use forensic methods based in science and medicine to ascertain what we can learn about what happened to these people, specifically over three time frames. First, things that happened to them before they died, things that occurred to them or happened to them around the time of their death, including how they died, and those things that occurred to the bodies and, and remains in the post-mortem period, such as dismemberment and deposition uh, into pots. So these are the, this is the universe, as it were, the scope of forensic science and medicine in this case. It is a collaborative effort. Um, forensic anthropology has been uh, very instrumental. The Center of Forensic Science will be performing a DNA and toxicological examinations, and my staff has been working tirelessly to assist um, whatever we can do to ascertain the truth behind these cases. Thank you for your attention. Any questions for Dr. Blair? Do we have any indication about the cause of death, even for some of the victims, you believe it's different? different causes of death? So at this time, uh, the cause of death is pending further studies. Um, you can imagine that the state of decomposition um, and the um, dismemberment process requires us to reconstruct remains uh, and then uh, collect all of the relevant data 
anatomical data, toxicological data, put it all together to ascertain the cause of death. That is a painstaking process and it's stepwise. It'll take some time. Given that, is, is there a possibility you'll not be able to ascertain the cause of death? It's possible. I mean, at this point in time, we just have to see where the data takes us. Dr. Blair, do you have the remains of either individual, or are the remains still incomplete for all the I, I don't, won't ask. I won't answer any specific questions about uh, about the remains at this time. But won't that affect the process that you're talking about? Are you still waiting for that, or can you give us a sense of what the challenges are beyond the scientific part when you're trying to analyze what you do have? Like, does that affect it? Well, there, there are two main variables in that way. First of all, decomposition uh, can affect how, how accurately we can determine the cause of death. Um, and second, as you've mentioned, the completeness of the remains. So, for example, um, if you have an incomplete set of remains, it may be very difficult to ascertain the cause of death. So, we're in that space where we have um, technical issues related to both decomposition and the effects of uh, post-mortem dismemberment. And those are the things that we're working through scientifically right now. It, it might be tough for you to answer this, Doctor, but in, in the cases of the seven uh, dismembered remains, does it appear that the suspect has, has uh, put them in the ponders in the same way in each case? Again, that's details that will, that will have to come later. You mentioned doing toxicological or toxicological analysis. How do you do this with these remains that could have been there for quite some time? Well, I mean, there are various techniques uh, for uh, performing toxicological examinations, not simply on body fluids. So there are other sources of uh, tissue um, that we can use for toxicological testing. Why is it important to have that? Because we want to get a complete data set. So we want to know, as I mentioned, there are disease factors, chemical or toxicological factors, and injury factors which often go into ascertaining the cause of death. So it's often as much uh, as a positive finding as it is a negative finding. So the accumulation of both positive and negative scientific evidence ultimately then allows us to make um, a reasonable conclusion about, for example, the cause of death um, or whether or not um, exogenous compounds were used. Doctor, are you able to determine uh, post-injury and anti-injury, even though you can't determine the cause of death? Are you able to do that with remains? So in general, um, when we approach injuries um, at the time of autopsy, we tend to divide injuries up into three time periods. Those injuries that have occurred clearly before the person has died, the most common example of that would be a healing injury. That's obviously occurred uh, quite a bit of time before the person died. Those injuries that occurred around the time of death, and those often may in fact be the cause of death. And there are injuries that the body can sustain after death. Um, one example of that is dismemberment, but that's not the only example. Um, the mother, another very common injury that happens um, post-mortem is, for example, exposure to fire. So there are, many, there are many different types of injuries that you can document at autopsy, and then you have to ascertain over which of those three time periods uh, those injuries occurred. For this uh, alleged seventh victim, any idea a time of death, a rough date when uh, he might have been killed? Uh, I can't get into specifics about, uh, about the case. I, my role here really is to describe our methodology and process at this time. When you look at the, the size of this investigation, we've heard from police this is unprecedented. In your expertise, can you talk about what this is like for you, what it's like for your team, how many people you have on it, and, and the gravity of, of this investigation? Well, this is a unique investigation in the history of, uh, of our organization. Um, it is drawing on the talents and the expertise of essentially everyone in the organization. And I can tell you that um, I'm very grateful for the dedication uh, of all of our staff in, this, uh, um, in their efforts in this case, not only because of the uh, gravity of the situation, the technical difficulties presented with the case, but also with the volume of work. So all of those things um, are challenging, uh, organizationally and individually. 
So are you saying that cause of death has not been determined for any of the seven remains? Uh, what I'm saying is that we, we're not releasing any of the causes of death at this time. And that is mostly related to the fact that we're undertaking further studies. All of those studies that I've told you about will produce positive and negative findings. Not all of them are complete yet. And this photo, was it found on Mr. MacArthur's computer? Can someone answer that question? Well, I'm seized on it. In a situation like this where you're releasing a photograph of a deceased person, if a family member uh, notifies you that that is my my loved one, is the next step then to be able to DNA test you compare after the visual image to confirm? Not necessarily. So, uh, as I said, we um, determine identification through classical methods, including DNA. So, for example, um, if a body is well preserved, um, it is possible to obtain fingerprints. So, if there are if there are fingerprints during life, we can determine, um, or rather, the forensic identification officers can determine whether or not um, there's compatibility between those prints. So, that would be a that would be a major method. Dental examination, um, looking at <coughs> dental records of the person. Uh, comparing them to the teeth that we have at the time of the examination. That's a very important method. Um, and also um, medical records. If you think about yourself um, and all your own physical characteristics and medical characteristics, those are actually recorded in your medical records. And those actually can provide us um, a reasonable basis to uh, conclude identity in some circumstances. In reality, however, um, what we uh, tend to use is a variety of different methods. Uh, we put all of that information together to provide a strong, the strongest conclusion that we can about identification. Are, are there any remains that are lacking some of that data from before they're missing? Any um, remains where you, you have any fingerprints or, or dental records that just aren't hitting any, uh, any records? Again, I, I'm not going to talk about specifics, but I will say this, and that is that, um, as you know, not everyone will have fingerprints uh, on file um, in the anti-mortem record. So therefore, unless there is something to compare the fingerprints to, we can't use fingerprints as an identification means. Do you have an idea of what Again, I'm, not, I'm going to uh, I'll leave those detective uh, questions to the detective. Is there a pattern to the dismemberment? Those are those are quest answers that will come later. Is this a composite image or is it a singular image? I think I'm going to uh, turn it over to the detective. Are there any more questions for the doctor before we ask the detective? Sorry, <coughs> to start the volume again. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Who's first? I had a question. Uh, How do you make the link between the seventh set of names and this photograph? I don't. There we is have a link. It could be no. a completely No, and, and it's it's been a bit of a misconception, uh, especially this morning. Though our charges are linked to our found remains, they're they're not, uh, except for the one found set of remains, which is scanned in Abraham, and we didn't lay that charge until we identified those remains. The other charges were laid before any remains were identified. So are we looking at two more victims today? We don't know. So, so wait, Sergeant, given that you've exhausted, as you say, you've exhausted all these other investigative means before releasing this picture, have you been able to come up with any possible profile of who he might be given the avenues you've already gone down to try to identify him? No, we've received no information whatsoever. We've shown this picture to, uh, to several people, and we don't know who this gentleman is. So I'm sure someone will recognize him or think they rec recognize him, and I would ask Anyone who does, please call us as soon as possible. We'd like to identify this gentleman. As of last week, you only had uh, identified three of the six uh, dismembered remains. So, so now we have four unidentified dismembered remains. Is that correct. correct? Yes. And this man is unrelated to those remains? We don't know that yet until we identify him. How extraordinary is it for you to put a photo like this on a news conference? I've never done this. And I, I, I do it uh, with great hesitation. Uh, it's obviously a, a key piece of evidence that we have that we're releasing, but we do feel that 
by releasing it, hopefully we can identify him and, and close off that area of investigation. Are there other, are there other photos like this of men you're still working to identify? That I'm not going, going to comment on. So, so as far as the investigative yeah. steps go, you, you know, I realize you've got a lot of occurrences to go through and, and phone calls and for concerned people who have missing family members. Are you looking at the sudden death occurrences as well, just on the off chance? Uh, some sudden death occurrences have been brought to our attention, yes. Do you know that have remained you know for you Sorry. Do you know approximately how long this will, um, how long it will approximate until you finally got all the victims, you finally got all the names to it, you got everything? Do you know how long that might take? Or I don't. I, I, I hope to identify the seven sets of remains that we have so far uh, over the next several weeks or months. That's about the best timeline I, I can give you. Just to clarify the remains of the seventh set that you just uh, announced that you found, were they found in Flanders on Mallory Crescent as well? Yes, sir. Previously, when you uh, spoke to us a couple of weeks ago, I believe you had said that you had gone through all the planters at Mallory and that you had I found six remains. Did you, you know, were you withholding the seventh? How did you, uh, you know, at what point did the seventh uh, w was found? I wasn't withholding, but I think if uh, Dr. Plannon didn't give an adequate enough explanation, I can't really get into specifics about why we hadn't realized that there were seven remains there, but we had finished the planters a couple of It was weeks just ago. So, so decomposed? Again, I can't get specific about it. Just to clarify, Sorry? Uh, your guess is as good as mine, Sam. So. What do you I want the public? picture of this man deceased, just to clarify, Detective Sergeant? We believe it is, yes. What do you want the public to know about this identified man if they're listening? Like someone hears that today released this photo and they think they have him. Where do they go? They can call Crime Stoppers anonymously. They can call the Homicide Squad, 808-7400. They can call our tip line, 808-2021. They can call any division in the city. They can call any police service in the province. They'll pass the information on to us, and uh, hopefully we can figure out who he is. Is this a composite photo? That I'm not going to comment on. Do you know what photo is he again? Sorry? Is this a photo of a body or a live person that we're looking at? We believe this is a photo of a deceased person. Do you know when the photo was taken? No, I don't. Yeah, but there's always like, there's no exit data or metadata from this image. That's interesting. Have you searched that? And did you get any sort of information or details when or how this was taken? That goes without saying, yes. Do you have other photos like this about Again, I'm not going, going to comment on that. As you ask the public for help and information, can you shed any light on when this individual you believe may have been killed? I don't know. Did you find this one because the weather was good uh, recently, or and then you expect the earth to fall and find more? This photo? Yes. Yeah, so or the, the seventh? No, we already had those remains. So where's the idea of where the dismembering happened? What location or locations is the primary relation to dismembering this people? That we don't know yet, no. Where's the investigation stand in terms of recovering remains, searching for remains? We're uh, pretty much in the same position where we are still waiting for some warmer weather to revisit some of the sites that we've already visited. Uh, as I've stated previously, there are several addresses that we're more interested in than, than others. Uh, but we, we are <coughs> continuing those searches. What can you tell us about cause of death? I can't. When we spoke Do you to know you any of them, though? Sorry? Do you know any of the causes of death? Uh, I believe we have some evidence which would indicate a cause of death, but it's not something I'm going to get specific about right now. When we spoke with you a few weeks ago, you, you said that you believe there was more than one location where the murders had occurred. Um, do you have a number now on how many locations these murders occurred at? I do not, no. So where are you at, Detective, in terms of identifying now four sets of remains? Sorry, say that again? Where are you at in terms of identifying what we have now as four sets of remains? We still have four sets of unidentified remains, and we've gone through fingerprints and dental records. We're now into the DNA process, and the timetable for that is ultimately up to the Center of Forensic Sciences and see when they can get, get us some answers on that, providing that we've provided them with the right set of uh, DNA artifacts to test. Do we have a better timeline for how long these remains uh, go back for? Well, our earliest murder charge is Skanda Navaratnam, who was killed in 2010 and whose remains have been identified. 
So that's as far back as I can go right now. We, we reported last week that there was a house in Oshawa where Mr. MacArthur used to live with his wife and family. Uh, you got a tip uh, that you confirmed to us that uh, said that someone used to babysit. She wasn't allowed to go into the basement, into the garage. What do you plan to do with that premises? We're aware of that information. Uh, keep in mind that we're also privy to more information that you're not necessarily privy to. So right now, uh, I, I can't comment on exactly what we've done with that house or where we're going with that house, but we are aware of it. Jackie, what's the status on the historical cases you are going to look back on? Have, do you have a sense of how many <coughs> you're at or where that process is at? Uh, we've just begun, essentially. Uh, I, I, I can't give you a number. I can tell you that we are going through some historical cases. I see the old case. Uh, Detectives here. That means the photo was taken. Yeah. Uh, cold case has had some involvement in this, yes. Is it a challenge, though, that his victimology or the profile of his victims might have changed over the decades? And from, what we've, from what we've learned from experts that we've spoken to, is that something that you're keeping in mind when you're looking back? Absolutely. We and as as you stated, the uh, the profile actually has changed over the recent years, not just the decades. So we've got to be very cognizant of that as we go through some of these old cases. What do you look for then? Uh, missing persons uh, that haven't haven't been located, unsolved cold murder cases. Uh, some like like I said earlier, some sudden deaths. We're looking at everything. Can you foresee a task force being put put together as, if this continues? There is as large as this investigation is going to grow. Can you, can you see that down the road? Are, like, you, you, know, the are you differentiating between a task force and a project? Or project, task force or a project. Do you see what they put together for this? For so so essentially, long? we do have a project going, and over the weeks it's been expanded, and we will keep that project going until we don't have anything left to do. You say when you uh, first began investigating Mr. MacArthur that he, he did not specifically, technically was your term, have a criminal record. If he had have had a criminal record when you began investigating him, could it have led to an arrest sooner? That's a very big hypothetical. I don't know. Sergeant, you said before that international police are actually involved in this investigation. Are you able to tell us a little bit more about how they have helped you in this? Not yet. Not yet. If I get some answers on that, I, I hopefully will be something I can share. you're still share. looking into the possible activity outside of Canada? Possible, yes. Does this project have a name? Prism. Detective Sergeant, uh, I'm sure you've heard from dozens of witnesses, people who knew the victims as well as MacArthur. If there are other vic people who knew MacArthur who don't believe they have information, but are there people like that you think that are still out there that you'd like to hear from? I believe there are people out there who may have some information who have not come forward yet uh, and sometimes people like to select what information they they bring forward and I would just encourage anyone with any information whatsoever any encounter that they've had with Mr. MacArthur whether it be on the street or whether it be sexual to please contact us and hopefully we can add some pieces to the jigsaw puzzle. Why do you think some people might be holding back certain pieces of information are coming forward period? Well, I th think there's probably lots of different social reasons for that, but all I can do is, is encourage them to, uh, to come forward. They can contact me directly uh, through the Homicide Squad. They can contact their local division, but please, no matter how small the information is, please bring it forward to us. Have you received information lately that might have helped you much earlier? Just a nod to Chief Saunders' remarks to the Globe and Mail last week. Is there a sense that I've had people who are talking to you now, spoken to you earlier, that there might have been a different outcome? I don't know whether there would have been a different outcome or not. Uh, there is information that has come forward that did not come forward uh, earlier, and we would have liked to have that information, definitely. Uh, like I said, I. I Hypothetically, could things have changed? I, I really don't know. The counselor is supposed to show up in court on March the 14th. Um, do you think you could lay another charge before that? Or? I don't know. Is the cop talking to the police? That I can't get into. Is the expectation that there will be more victims, is that still the expectation? At this point in time, I, I really don't know. How is an investigation like this wearing on, on yourself, your colleagues, as you know, the weeks go into months and potentially into years? Uh, obviously, it's, it's been a rough couple of, almost 
two months now since Mr. MacArthur was arrested, let alone the work that went into the investigation prior to that. Uh, and I've said before, some of the investigators on the team have been with the investigation since Project Houston in late 2012. Uh, everyone's tired, uh, but everyone's working hard because they do have a vested interest in a successful outcome. So it's a lot of work, it's a, it's a lot of hours, but we're getting the job done that we're supposed to get done. When police were wrapping up at Mallory Crescent, there was a planter that was taken off site um, and police said it was being done as out of an abundance of caution and that it was frozen solid and it needed to defrost. Were the seventh remains found in that planter? That I'm not going to get specific about. Can you tell us how long you had this image? No, I won't comment on how long we've had it or where it came from. Can you speak to the accuracy of the image? Can the public be assured that this is 100% or perhaps a composite where it's 90%? That's what we're trying to get at. This is an actual image. It's not a composite. Uh, it has been enhanced. It has been modified uh, to remove some artifacts. But that's it, it's a cleaned up image. But hopefully it's accurate enough that someone will be able to recognize this gentleman. Is it a picture taken from where MacArthur killed his victim? Again, I'm not going to comment on where the picture came from. But it came out um, in your investigation? Yes. Was it found on his computer? Thank you. That concludes today's conference. Uh, the image will remain up and uh, it will also be available on the Toronto Police website.